justification of us is supposed to be guided by religion. Our Father in Christ, in his sermons today, he asked a critical condition. How much do you love yourself? How much do you love yourself? Because philosophy tells us it is hypocritical to give something to somebody which you would not love to be given to you. So if you do not love yourself entirely, there's no way you can love other people. And the love that you have in you, it is the representation of God who is your creator, the master architect. What you see, the image of another person, it is the veritable symbol of God's ineffable architectonics. When I speak, I speak because of the will of God. When I look, I look and observe because of the will of God. The five senses that constitutes our body or our being or our structure as a human being, that is the manifestation of God. That is the manifestation of God. So religion helps us to cultivate another sense, a sixth, a sixth sense. That is a sense of spiritualism. The sense of spiritual, the spiritual sense, it is a sense, it is a sense which is not observable. It lies latent within you. It lies in your brain. And if we observe um, uh, new, the science of neurologists or the science that deals with the brain, the, 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 the things in the brain, there is a gland in the brain known as the pineal gland, or in esotericism, they call it the psychopian eye. That's where the spirit dwells. The pineal gland, that's where the spirit dwells in a human being. So biology cannot show you that sense. But the more we bring in unison these five senses, it is a catalyst that arouses the sixth sense to come into effect. Now, the sixth sense, it is the sense that carries our spiritualism. So Father reminded us that we need to cross-check how we love ourselves. When we cross-check how we love ourselves, we will be able to embrace God's creation. That is to love other human beings because God himself is love. So if you feel like, yes, I do love myself, you're going to be able to love other people. You're not going to be able to frown you're not going to be able to, to, I mean, to worry that much because of your plans haven't gone the way you had planned them to go. No, you have that sixth sense that keeps you, that gives, that keeps that hope, that facilitates that hope that even though things haven't gone the way I planned them, I believe that God who created me, he wouldn't have put me. He wouldn't have decided to put me in the position where I am, whereby his provisions won't reach me. No. God's provisions reach his people in each and every position where they are stationed. The more we cultivate the sense of spiritualism, dear brothers and sisters, we're going to see the decline of the world chaos. We're going to see the decline of, you know, Despicable deeds being meted at the people by their fellow human beings. So we need to cultivate the sense of spiritualism because that is God. Your spirit, the spirit that resides, resides within you, it dwells inside that gland. It is called a pineal gland or a psychopian eye. It is in your brain. 
That is where the spirit dwells, apart from the five senses known in biology or in life science. So, dear brothers and sisters, let's keep on calling upon God's name so that he can give us light to see the goodness in each and every one of us, to see the goodness in all his creation, to embrace God's creation because that's where knowledge is. Our bodily senses are limited, but the mind can surpass where the bodily senses cannot go beyond. So the mind can contemplate by observing a plant, by observing a seed, how it germinates from the ground. Dear brothers and sisters, life, it is so complicated. Life, it, it can be sophisticated at times, but the cause, the causation of that sophistication of life, according to our comprehension, it is the unnecessary wants that at times we emulate, or at times it comes to us due to peer pressure. When we fail to pay our bills on time, when we observe why it's like that, you can see that it could be our own miscalculation or it could be the things which are beyond which are beyond your your understanding so that faith can help you to soldier on while you have some burdens on you but you have faith in god that whatever that is transpiring in your life god has not sown it god is watching you god is watching you and you know that god never created you to suffer in the first place god created you for a reason because the uniqueness in you it is only in you, and God himself will never allow that uniqueness to go unnoticed or its purpose to go unfulfilled. That is impossible. God does not make a mistake. If he still permits you the breath of life, that means your possibilities of attaining the things that you desire and 99.9 percent .9%. the more the breath of life still come to you my brothers and sisters everything is achievable thus we are saying that no power is too sacred to be totally ignored for fear of incurring the ill will of the touch me potentate those self-styled rulers of men the dictators the pastors who twist the words of God to their own benefit. So when we observe God, when we impress God, he gives us knowledge to discriminate between false teaching and true knowledge. When we embrace God, it gives us a light and say that the possibilities in the universe are inexhaustible. The possibilities in the universe are in inexhaustible. You cannot finish them. So brothers and sisters, especially my brothers and sisters in Uganda, we are under subjugation for the past 40 years. Dear brothers and sisters, we are under subjugation for the past 40 years. So the emancipation of our souls from the predicament of dictatorship, it has a lot to do with our mindset, our mental capacity, how we observe the things. And the things that we observe, they are scrutable. They can be understood if you concentrate on, on them. So, dear brothers and sisters, I came across a document in a book or a memo authored by Tata Madiba Mandela Olifasha. Dear brothers and sisters, allow me to read to you a passage that I extracted from there, and it is impended to uplift the minds of teenagers and post-teenagers thereabout. 
the young people of Uganda. The young people of Uganda. This was a speech that was made by the initiator, the man who performed the circumcision ceremony of Madiba Mandera and his fellow initiates. Dear brothers and sisters, let me share with you this one here a bit. A speech which was made by a speech which was made by Chief Mulikal on Mandela's uh, circumcision ceremonial. It states like this, and I quote, There sit our sons, young and health, young and health and handsome, the flower of the Osa tribe, the pride of our nation. We have just circumcised them in a ratio that promises them manhood. But I tell you, but I'm here, but I am here to tell you that it is an empty, erosional promise, a promise that can never be fulfilled. For we as Corsas and all black South Africans are conquered people. We are slaves in our own land, in our own country. We are tenants on our own soil. We have no strength, no power, no control over our own destiny. In the land of our birth, in the land of our forefathers. Dear brothers and sisters, that is a speech which was given to Mandela and his fellow initiates on their circumcision ceremony. Dear brothers and sisters, it is intended and it's going most especially to the young generation of Uganda. And the reason why I'm, I'm reading this document, it is to show you in relation to the predicament of the people of Uganda we are in. And it is not a mistake. We know the causation of the problem the people of Uganda are enduring right now. Now, the chief priest who circumcised Mandela and his fellow initiates at that time. They were 16 years old. He reminded them, young as they were, handsome as they were, young as you are and handsome as you are. So, the circumcision ratio that promises the closer people manhood, the chief priest reminded them, that this is an empty promise, an illusionary that will never be fulfilled. So in relation to the situation in Uganda, let's assume that a child graduates from school. Even though we have cultures that performs the same ritual, it is known as the, the Masaba land in the Bugisu region. They perform a circumcision ratio exactly as the Kosa tribe here in South Africa. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, South Africans, the Ingunis, immigrated from the east side of Africa to the southern hemisphere. Now, we have a lot in common. So suppose that the Masabas, we call it Embalu, in Kimasaba. That is the language of that tribe that has got similarities in those ratios of initiating a young man into manhood. Now, these people, the chief told the guys, the young men, that the circumcision won't amount to anything if your land is conquered. Dear brothers and sisters on the African continent, Dear brothers and sisters in Uganda, as we speak right now, our manhood does not mean anything according to what Museveni has done to us. Our self-estimate, our self-esteemed cultures, they are no longer strong as they were because they are all under siege. It is a fact. 
their brothers and sisters. Do you think that a graduate from a university, his education, the education that person has extracted from the university, won't, will it amount to anything when he cannot cultivate the land, when he cannot be employed because of his name, when he cannot be selected or appointed by the state according to their merits or expertise or capabilities or abilities imparted into them by the will of the Most High. It cannot amount to anything because there is a tribal sentiment within the people who captured the political institutions of the Republic of Uganda. So, the chief reminded Madiba and his fellows that we have a, a big work. We have a task at hand to free our people, to free our minds, to retain what is rightfully ours. He told 16-year-old boys, 16-year-old boys, a chief reminded them, all these ratios, esteemed as they are to us, Pride, proud as we are as Tosa. In the context of Uganda, pride as I am as a Muganda, pride as you are as a Munyolo, pride as you are as a Munubi, pride as you are as a Kakwa, pride as you are in any given in any given tribe that constitutes the country of Uganda or the nations in Uganda, brothers and sisters, our pride it is nothing because we are under subjugation. We are under subjugation, dear brothers and sisters. Young ones, Ugandans, daughters and sons who reside in diaspora, those who doesn't know anything about Uganda, you are young in age, you are teenagers, you are young in age. But the land in which we reside, the land of South Africa, the land of Madiba, the land of a global icon who stood his ground, who refused to be intimidated, who did not care about the ill will of the touch me not penitent, the dictators and the like. He stood his ground, he was initiated, and he was, the message was coded into him that these initiations, they are just ceremonial. If we don't have the control over our destiny. Thus, I captioned my presentation for today in these religious philoscientific vibrations that man, Africans, stroke Ugandans, we are co-authors of our salvation. God gave us each and everything. If we are instructing our children, we instruct them that God is everything. So if God is everything, tell me one man who can scare me if I'm claiming the righteousness, if I'm claiming what is rightfully for me. Tell me one strong man under the sun on the surface of the earth can stop me to reclaim what is rightfully ours. Madiba was reminded that we don't have control on our own land. As we speak in Uganda, Citizens by descent, people who were born in Uganda, they don't have the right on their birthright. You know why? Because the people, the former refugees from Rwanda, revoked their birthright. How did they do that? Because they changed the constitution to make an expiry date on a citizen by descent. If your citizens... Your citizenship expires within 10 years or a decade. You are no longer a citizen of Uganda. No, you are not. You have to renew your birthright. Dear brothers and sisters, how, how is that possible? How is that conceivable? 
by a righteous mind, by a mind which went all through the stages, by a mind which has read the, 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 the Holy Scriptures, by a mind which have seen the events, the turn of events under the sun, you believe that Africans, or Ugandans in particular, should accept this man who stripped off their citizenship by descent and decided that he should renew your being a Ugandan every after 10 years. Now, dear brothers and sisters, I have a question to ask. All these laws are being passed in the legislative assembly or in the legislature. You know? In those legislatures, they are representatives. The representatives represent the nations that constitutes the country Uganda as it is known geographically. You understand? Now, suppose, suppose a cruise boat, suppose a cruise boat was sailing on Lake Victoria. And the cruise boat it is in a distance. Now, the people on board or the crew on the cruise board sends a signal to Uganda Communications Commission that we have encountered a problem. We have a problem. We are going to sink. Now, Uganda's Communication Commission sends a message to national disaster management, the Department of Disaster Management. Now, UCC, Uganda Communication Commission, sends a message to the Department of Disaster Preparedness and Management so that they can send a relief to save the people on the boat cruise on Lake Victoria. Now, having received a message from Uganda Communication Commission, the National Disaster Management Authority dispatches a speedboat. A speedboat rushes to the yacht or to the, the cruise boat. On board, there are 900 souls, we suppose, right? Now, this speed boat, it reaches to a boat, which is gradually sinking. Now, it only manages to save 15 people out of 900. So, dear brothers and sisters, are we supposed to hire the Department of Disaster Preparedness to save 15 people out of 900? Are we supposed to hire them and we clap hands and we applaud them and we say that national disaster management is well prepared? Because they managed to save 15 people out of 900? No. We are not going to applaud that. So, dear brothers and sisters, this analogy I'm trying to draw here, it is in relation with the members of parliament. In Uganda, National Unity Platform, a political party which is under the umbrella of people power. People power, it is the movement, as you can see this beret I'm done done today, as always. It represents that movement, people power, amanza, awetu, awetu, amanza. That people, they are the real government. And the elected members are servants of the people. You understand? So now, National Unity Platform has got 58 parliamentarians representing their constituencies, their constituencies respectively. Now, let's assume that 
the speedboat which was dispatched by the Uganda National Disaster Management Authority, let's assume that a speedboat which was sent there represents a member of parliament. Now, we have 58 members of parliament. And the souls which are about to perish on the boat cruise, they are 900. Now, this, they manage only to dispatch one boat. So one boat carries only 15 people. So 750. Seven hundred people are still there. So now, we looking for a unified force. The causation of why our parliament is not functioning, or it is not serving the need of the people who sent them there in the parliament to legislate for their benefit or to better their lives. Not to give them money, but to put medicine in the hospital, to make the judicial system to be independent, to held the, I mean, the, the executive to be held accountable where they fail. And the, the, the legislature to be legislating the bills which are meant to uplift the lives of those people whom they claim to be representing. Now, if one is only standing up in the parliament to raise the issues that torments the people of the Republic of Uganda, that people, his voice, can be compared to a boat which went to save, which was dispatched to save 900 people on the boat cruise, which is sinking. Whereas if these 50, 50, 80 members of parliament, if they were all dispatched, we put them in the sense of the boats. If 58 boats were dispatched to, to, to rescue those people, none of the souls will perish. Because each boat brings 15 people. So 900 divided by 58, you get 15. I'm not good in mathematics. Nambi, now, I might be wrong in mathematics, but dear brothers and sisters, just bear with me. I'm trying to, to build a scenario so that my narrative can be well understood by you brothers and sisters who are looking at me here. Don Gaddafi, respect my brother. You understand? So, if these 58 members of parliament were the bots that were dispatched to save the lives which we are going to sink, don't you think these people who deserve to be held, who deserve to be glorified, that they have manifested the unification and the preparedness for any disaster that might strike. Now, politics, as we speak in the Republic of Uganda, it is a disaster, whereby the constitution is always being abrogated, the constitution is always being molested to sort the needs of the illegitimate regime led by a former refugee from Rwanda, Yowirim Seveni Kaguta. Now, dear brothers and sisters, these people have been in parliament for the past two and a half years. Now, they are telling us that they are boycotting what Yowirim Seven. They are boycotting some things for the past two and a half years. For the past two and a half years. Dear brothers and sisters, that a day, that is just one day. Now, if you compare 
two and a half years. How many days do we have there? 913. Two and a half years. We have 913 days in two and a half years. Two and a half years. It is compared to the people who are in the sinking boat. Those people in the sinking boat, in a broader picture, it is the entire country of Uganda. Now, these members of parliament, they are trying to show us they are boycotting to enter the parliament. And their reason of boycotting, it is because we've been telling the African people that Museven is kidnapping Ugandans, people, voices of dissent, people who are refusing to be subdued by the mass of a gang. Those are the people who are being kidnapped on a daily basis for the past two and a half years. I'll concentrate on two and a half years because that's when the parliamentarians took oath to deliver to the people who sent them into the legislature. Now, two and a half years, people have been being kidnapped. It has become rampant, this rampant enforced dis disappearance of the people whom the state is supposed to protect, to cater for, in any given aspect that better a human race. Dear brothers and sisters, are we supposed to hire this parliament, to hire them, to praise them, that they are doing something good? Having been silent for the past 913 days, they have been silent. So this one, what they did, isn't it equivalent to the boat which was dispatched by the National Disaster Preparedness to save 900 people, but they sent a speedy boat which can only save 15 people out of 900. So should we say that the boat, the small boat, did a good job? No. No. The smaller boat, it did not do a good job because why did, why did they dispatch only one boat? In South Africa, there is what they called, yeah, it's also called disaster preparedness department. But during COVID, people were given food. People shared, everything was, was catered for. During COVID, I saw how essential that department is in a functional state. Now, Uganda is sinking. Only one member of parliament is raising a voice. Zakebu Tebi. Zakebu Tebi is in the position of a speed boat. But the speed boat, they, would have, they were supposed to be 58 speed boats that goes to save the people on board on a sinking cruise ship. You understand? But this one boat can only save 15 people out of a hundred, out of 900. We need the boat that can save a larger proportion of the lives which are in danger. So 40 millions of Ugandans are in danger. You know why I'm saying 40 million Ugandans are in danger? The state, the state through parliamentarians initiated or oh, passed a bill into law that extracts kidding, a heart, internal organs are being extracted. And it is, it is considered as a recalative in sustaining the illegitimate regime. Dear brothers and sisters, why would parliamentarians do not legislate that Museven, the people of Uganda, took to the polls? We need a recounting of the votes. 
We need the thorough reports of the disappearance of nationals. We want to know what was the cause. Why did you strip off Ugandanese their citizenship by descent and started imposing an expiry date on their citizenship? Parliamentarians are supposed to legislate such matters. Museven keeps on extorting. Museven keeps on distorting the truth on a continental level and on, on, on a continental level and on a global scale. Brothers and sisters, Ugandans, propaganda it is not intended to change the minds of critical thinkers. But it is intended to retard the minds of the carefree youth not to think at all. So if parliamentarians are quiet and they are comfortable with their salaries and their allowances and their cars provided to them, mind you, through the taxpayers' money, Are we supposed to hire them? And another thing that baffles me the most, they represent national unity platform or people power. I will stick to people power. And we have an emblem. We have a beret. We have a beret that represents the ideology. People power is our power. That is the ideology. Power belongs to the people. Elected members are servants of the people. These members of parliament, they know they are boycotting. Yes, suppose on, the, on, on, the, on behalf of the people whom they represent. But we don't see the symbol of the people whom they represent, which is a beret. Prior to their being elected into offices, none of them could appear before the camera without a beret done down on their heads. But as we speak at these critical junctures, we don't see the berets. So the international community, they cannot differentiate who is shaking a dictator in Uganda. The legitimately elected president of the Republic of Uganda, Robert Chagulanyi Sentamu, in all his tireless efforts on a global scale, he dons on a beret. He dons on a beret. He will never leave a beret because it is the symbol of people power. Why is it so that parliamentarians do not don on a beret when they are representing the people who elected them because of the symbol of a beret? Are you real in your boycotting to sit in the parliament? Are you real? You the leader of them? Are you real? Are you for real? Remember, philosophy tells us, philosophy tells us that a lie, in order a lie to stand, it has to be backed up or facilitated by almost a million words. Are you real? You, the leader of the opposition businesses in parliament, are you real? I rarely see you donning on a beret. When we look in the legislature, national legislature or federal legislature of South Africa, the economic freedom fighter, they are always clad in their uniform, red, hemoglobin. It is the symbol of the blood that runs in the stream of our veins. A man who claimed to be the leader of the parliamentarians, 80, 58 of them, we don't see them donning on a beret. Only that one bot, which is Zakebu Tebi, which is Zawar Senyon, which is uh, my brother Mark India West. 
Ah, nyeko. Nyeko. My brother Nyeko is a representative. We don't see other parliamentarians donning on a cape. You're trying to you're trying to change the foundation that brought you into the August House. You're trying to change the convictive the conviction of Ugandans who buys the beret. You want to make the people believe that your mixed colors, your mixed colors, your mixed colors, trying to, 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 to wither away, to wither away the burning desire of Ugandans to change. Because why am I calling it a burning desire? The people of Uganda took to the polls on 14th January year 2021 and elected leaders, leaders, leaders. But they found a conventional politician, conventional politician in the house and he was appointed to be their leader. But to our surprise, to our surprise, he is the leader who is pouring water on that fire that took those young men there. Because he is a conventional politician. Because apparently, he's one way or the other conniving with the dictator to enslave Ugandans more. You know why he chose that path? Because as a politician, there must be some extortion and distortion and plundering. So, he has a mentality that by perpetuating dictatorship, it, is of great, it will be of great benefit to him to protect the spoil he has acquired or attained from distorting the truth, which is a lie. Because so long as the sun comes and go, the truth will reveal itself. Dear brothers and sisters, we're not joking here. We are telling you, parliamentarians, that that boycotting you're seeing there, you acquired. You're not supposed to boycott. We need the front line. We need a battle on the parliament. You don't need to go out. You don't need to boycott because your allowances are still going there. And on a monthly basis, you're going to be paid. You need to be working. There's no way you can drop a gun in the middle of a, gutter, a battlefield. Your presence in the parliament, it is the weapon that you're supposed to utilize to approach the dictator. Your boycotting, it is not of great benefit. But your resistance, your physical resistance, you're pulling out the microphone on the table. You're tearing out of those nonsensical laws that they passed. That is the battle we want because the, the constitutions allow you to do that. And you are the legislators. So the international community will understand that the people of Uganda, the boots are really on their necks. You're still putting on ties and suits, trying to show your conventionalism, showing your diplomacy, which it has come to our realization that diplomacy, it is a curse. Diplomacy, it is a curse to modern leaders. Africa is breeding new leaders. We are less concerned about your false garment opinion. Suits and ties does not make a leader to be legible or to be a just leader. No. Leadership it is the conception of the heart. It is the conception of the heart. Dear brothers and sisters, philosophy reminded us that the past cannot be regarded without regrets. No other future can it be faced without misgivings. Now, if I picture elderly people, 70 and above, 
They are in the world of regression, having helped him seven to capture the political institutions of the Republic of Uganda. They are in the world of regression as we speak right now. I can picture Saba Sajja Kabaka, Ronald Mwenda Mutebi, Saba Taka, the Kabaka of Uganda Kingdom. I can picture him regretting. I can picture Naduli regretting why he connived with Museven and slain the people of Luwe. I can picture Katumba Wamala regretting why did he join Museven's army. I can picture a lot of them regretting. Philosophy tells us the past cannot be regarded without regrets. And the future cannot be faced without misgivings. Picture the people of Uganda who took to the polls, who lined it up in innumerable numbers almost. Because even the electoral commission, electoral commission failed to reach the votes appropriately. They tallied the votes and it went beyond 100%. You can see how weak they are in mind. Those are the people who are ruling over us. The past cannot be regarded without regrets. I can picture His Excellency Robert Chagulanyi Sentamu, the legitimately elected president of the Republic of Uganda, when he start scrutinizing those whom he seconded to be voted in or to be voted as representative of various constituencies. I can picture him regretting that is the past two and a half years ago. The past cannot be regarded without regrets. But the future cannot be faced. And the future cannot be faced without misgivings. Moseven, our fathers and mothers, they regretted for conniving with you for working with you. They regret it. They regret. But on your part, you thought, you thought that your venomous seed germinated and even gave birth to other, to other stuffs to proliferate. But the misgiving is right here. The future, the future, the future can't be faced without misgivings. Museveni, you never knew that there will come a less conventional politicians. Museveni, you never knew that the ghetto will get even time to articulate matters of national importance. Museveni, you never knew that there will come a man as a mechanic as I am, Bob, to be on your case. Museveni, you never knew that Ugandans will reach a point whereby they are no longer afraid of guns. They are no longer afraid of the blast of the gun. Museveni, you never knew that European Union will know who you are. Museveni, you never knew that the African community will understand who you are. Museveni, you never knew that your son won't be able to speak before the people. Those are the misgivings, M7. Those are the misgivings. Those are the misgivings under this journey of life. You made the elites of Uganda to regret why they seconded you, why they kept quiet, why they used their philosophy that do not be afraid. If you don't love this government, wait for it to go. And the one you love will come. They didn't know that conventional politicians can alter the constitution so that you can stay longer and longer and overstay and overstay as you have done, as you are doing. But in January 14th, year 2021, you were ostracized. Demonic possessed as you are, you were ostracized from the political institutions of the Republic of Uganda. Mr. Seven, it is known on the African continent 
What perturbs us is the silence of the African Union. What gives us sleepless nights? It is the silence of the African elites. Because we've been screaming to the top of our lungs for the past four years, close to five years, informing the people of Africa that Museven is a demon in the higher position of leadership. They are quiet. They are quiet. Yet when you hear them, when you hear them saying that white people are responsible for the suffering of a black man, for us we refuse to buy that narrative. My brothers and sisters on the African continent, if a white man was a threat to our existence in real sense, we wouldn't be studying the curriculum he studies. If he, not, if he did not want us to learn anything, if he did not want us to learn anything, he wouldn't be bringing the curriculum he teaches his in Europe to Africa. We wouldn't be studying the chemistry a white man studies. We wouldn't be studying the physics a white man studies. We wouldn't be studying any subject that is comprehensible to a human thought. We wouldn't be studying those. We have seen a lot of university in his recent uh, address. Professor Pierre O. Lumumba reminded the people of Africa that religion has been somehow misused. Some leaders to get or to gain their egoistic goals. He reminded us that the religion has been misused. And he called upon the young children of Africa to raise your voices. Not to buy into the narrative that our suffering it is sorely to a white man. What a white man does, greedy as he is, as any other human being, or failable as a white man is, as any other human being in the human race. A white man, if he sees a chance, he can utilize it. If he come across a weak-minded African leader such as Museven, he can be utilized by a white man. Britain consumes all natural resources in Uganda covertly, covertly. But when you go, when you go to the opaque website, you can see Uganda is selling barrels of crude oil. When you go to where God is sold on their websites, you can see Uganda is there. For the past almost a decade, Uganda is selling God. Uganda is selling God. Now, where does the white man come into that? Should we blame a white man for the Rwanda genocide? Should we blame a white man for the World Triangle genocide? Should we blame a white man for what's happening in Congo? In North Kivu? In the Eastern Congo? Should we blame a white man? How many white people are there held, wielded guns? If I may ask brothers and sisters on the African continent, how many are there? If you, a leader, create a loophole for a white man to utilize, he's going to utilize it. He's going to utilize it. A white man, he knows that these African people, these people, some, some, I'm not generalizing. No, I'm not generalizing. Few African greedy leaders are enslaving African people. By castigating a white man, and he tells a white man that, you know what, before the microphone or before the people, I'm going to speak all nonsense. I will abuse you. But please, don't worry about that. Those are just mere words. We know that now. Now we know that. A white man is not a threat. Mr. Seven. your castigating of a white man, it is a decoy. Your castigating of a white man, it is a decoy. You give a white man everything so that he can keep you in power. How does he keep you in power? 
He will give you more guns. He will give you more guns. He will give you more guns. He will give you more guns to slay us, to kill us. You think you can stop time, Mr. Mseven? Mr. Mseven, you think you can stop time? You think you can stop time? You cannot stop time. Mr. Mseven, you cannot stop time. You can't. So dear brothers and sisters on the African continent, it is high time for us to refute the narrative that a white man is the one enslaving or tormenting a black man. A black man has got the mind deposited in him by God, Father Almighty. To differentiate evil from good, light from darkness, Bad from goodness. The brain, it is within us. Man is in a guide. Reminded us, dear brothers and sisters on the African continent, that the worth of a man lies in his ability to initiate that which is latent under the secrets of his being. That what Robert Chagulany Sentamu did. The manifestation of the eternal conviction, divine wisdom, He came out and he told Ugandans that if you are ready to stand for the truth, you better be ready to stand alone. And he who provoke a war and you expect your friends to defend you, he said in his words, I pity you. He who provoke a war and you expect your friends to defend you, he pities you. Thus, the words that comes out of my mouth, they are my words. Even my confidant has no control over it. So we speak because of the love of our country. Dear brothers and sisters, if am I to check on the words of uh, one of the uh, teachers of mankind by the name of... Uh, by the name by the name, one of the teachers, greatest teachers of mankind. Hey, what is his name? What is his name? Manle Pihol. Manle Pihol reminded us that when religious people rule men, men at some point can be ruled by superstitions. When dictators rule men, Man is ruled by fear. When the gangsters rule men, man is ruled by ignorance. And he further asserted that up until man turns superstitions which is being manifested within the so-called pastors, some pastors, the so-called some pastors, the superstition is there, the twisting of the Holy Scriptures to fit their narratives. If we do not turn those superstitions into knowledge, as our Father in Christ reminded us today, that love, it is all that is there in God. That before you love another person, make sure how much do you love yourself. Dear brothers and sisters, if we turn superstition, if we turn superstition into real knowledge, there is no religious leader can mislead you. And he said that if we turn fear into love, no dictator can impose his ideology on us. How do we turn fear into love? Dear brothers and sisters, you love your country because it is your umbilical cord. So anybody who dares to mess around with your country, that love, that love, that love is going to make you to stand 
and face that person face to face with the coolness that bespeaks the intuitive conviction of a motherland. When dictators rule men, Manley P. Hall reminds us, man is ruled by fear. The fear of death. That is the root cause of perpetual enslavement. The fear of death. That is the root cause of perpetual enslavement. His Excellency Robert Chagulanyi Sentamu, in his artistic messages through his godly given talent of music, he reminded us that they really want to go to heaven, but they fear to die. Those who want to get rich, but they fear to sweat. So, and when you observe in metaphysics, the, 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 the process of creation, it is not a sudden process. It is a gradual process. Dear brothers and sisters, Ugandanese, Ugandanese, especially Ugandanese, even though I'm addressing all Africans, but my emphasis goes to Ugandanese because we are being retarded by conventionalism. Conventionalism. People can tell you, that you have nothing to do, those people have guns. Yes, they do have guns, but they don't make guns. No, they don't. And all of you Ugandans, you are full aware that the people who are ruling over us, they don't have even a single knowledge in any given aspect. Name them. Where are they excelling apart from burning schools Apart from killing clergies, especially the Catholic, they are killing all the bishops, the cardinals. They are poisoning them. That's, what, that's where they excel. Do you see them in sports? Do you see them in... Uh, do you see them in sports? They are, not in, they are not academicians. They are not excelling in medicine. They are not excelling in the engineering field. They are not excelling... In social understanding, they are not excelling in a, in a, in any given, in, in, in anything that uplifts a human being. So, brothers and sisters, we need to repair. We need to lift the veil which was casted on our conscious mind. Remember, Stephen Biko reminded us that it is with the minds that we serve the Lord. And that, that, the greatest weapon in the hands of an oppressor, it is the minds of the oppressed people. If you conceive in your mind that that guy has got a gun, and he is taking what belongs to you, apart from a phone or a car, you can take a car. But there's no such a thing as Bob the Mechanic without Uganda. There is no such a thing as Bob the Mechanic with an expired date on his citizenship or of being a Ugandan. And then they preying on our minds. And the elites, the educated are conforming. When they conform, the lay people suffers. Because educated people conformed to the demands of a dictator through the legislature, whereby a man can club you, can beat you in anyhow, and he is protected by the law. The law which was passed by educated people, the people whom, the people who were sent by the lay people to represent them in the parliament. So, brothers and sisters, isn't that that the mind is being enslaved? But Mali, he sang a song and he said, Emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. 
None but ourselves can free our minds. We are no fear for their weapons because none of them can stop the time. None of them can stop the time. The time is guaranteed by the Most High Lord God Father, the, God, the Father who, who grants us the breath of life. Dear brothers and sisters, life is eternal. Life, it is eternal. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid because life is eternal. If life was not eternal, we wouldn't be having ghosts coming speaking to us. Our forefathers who passed away a long time ago, they come and they speak. That is a clear symbol that life is eternal. And God permits those whom he loves to come and speak his people. Seven, as we speak, dear brothers and sisters on the African continent, being so wicked, he is the man now resorted to go into the darkness because he's not quite certain what the future holds for him. He is trying so very much to enforce his son, his dull son, into the position of leadership. A man who cannot speak before the people. Do you think he can't? No. He can. But God says that let me turn your child into a nuisance because the innocent blood on which your son has fed, the innocent blood on which your lineage is trampling, the innocent blood you have spilled, Ms. Seven, for the past 40 years. Ms. Seven, it's not a lie. It is known to your conscious minds and those who are close to you. They know how murderous you are, how insidious you are. You created a group known as Kabano, dear brothers and sisters on the African continent. Ms. Seven has got a trick. Ms. Seven has got a trick. He tries the beautiful women to get to prominent leaders. They create wrangles in, within the families of elderly people, prominent peoples, people whom they consider to be a threat to, your, to their venomous goal of creating a dynasty in Uganda where Museven does not have a, a, a piece of land that he is from there. He created a group, a group which goes on Profiling each and every business entrepreneur that does not come from his tribe. Museven, he is conniving. He is conniving with Britain. The Africans who are being rejected by Britain, they go, they repatriate them, they pass through Rwanda, and they enter them in Uganda. So these are the people who are oppressing other people. When Jakaya Kikwete, was it Jakaya Kikwete? Told him seven to remove or oh, oh, told the Interahemwes to go back to Rwanda and they refused. Museven accepted them. They were brought to Uganda, all of them. And when they went in a kingdom known as Renzululu, the king there asked, who are these people? Where are they coming from? By just a mere asking, his palace was sieged and people were slain, hundreds and hundreds. The man, the man who spearheaded in the slaining of the people of Renzululu, the man who spearheaded the throttling of innocent people on the orders of General Yorim 7. General Kutch, as we speak, he's on a death list. Meaning that what you do from 7, your reward in, in the end, it is death. It is death. So what kind of a person is this? So dear brothers and sisters on the African continent, be on guard. Be on guard. Museven. He is so infiltrative in nature. He can infiltrate people. He sends a woman and is calculating for 20 years his mission to take effect.
It is a fact. Dear brothers and sisters, parliamentarians, dear brothers and sisters on the African continent, I'll remind you one other crazy thing that is being done in the parliament of Uganda. In the parliament of Uganda, the deputy speaker, his name is Thomas Taebua. This is a man who was caught on a camera clubbing a civil servant, a worker of ESCOM. Because that man could not pay electricity bills. So the man went to disconnect electricity. This man, because he is attached to the evil family, he pulled out a cane and start clapping, beating a civil servant. It's on record. Now, this is the guy who is, who deputized the Speaker of Parliament. Brothers, we are being ruled by gangsters. That's why they instill fear in us. But teachers of mankind reminded us we are no longer held in bondage by the fear. Our hearts cries out for freedom. We feel something stirring, something within our being, something akin to what we were taught to look upon to as a far away ruler of righteousness. And we did look for that ruler and he is operative in us. That is God, the universal mind. God, God. Seven, God, the one who brought you. The one who brought you barefitted with the torn shirts on your back. It's on record. It's not a lie. It is the same Lord. It is the same Lord that prepared Robert Chagulan Sentamu from get go from inception. That he will take you out of power. Robert Chagulan Sentamu, before his birth, 1982, you were slaying people in Uganda. The year I was born, 1980, you had launched a war. You were already killing people. You were the one who sabotaged Idi Amin Dada's regime. You committed all the heinouses which they put on Idi Amin. Museven, you used the BBC through William Pike to distort information. Museven, you used the BBC through William Pike to distort information. You tarnished the name of Idi Amin Dada, a nationalistic leader who uplifted the minds of the people of Uganda to where we are right now. If it wasn't the punishment that God gave to the people of Uganda, the punishment through you, that one we considered. And I reminded you, the moment you stray from the punishment the Lord had set, and you do your own will, your own will, old man, your offspring will never have peace. Your offspring will never have peace in the land known as Uganda, they are not going to be persecuted by us. No. No. But the Lord who brought you, he is going to persecute your offspring. He is going to punish them. Not to persecute, to punish them. The Lord will punish them. Mr. M7, you are witnessing the first punishment. You are witnessing the first punishment. First of all, you are rotting. You cannot walk without a cannula in your thighs. Your hands are rotting. You are smelling like a dead body, but you are still breathing. Those are the doings of the Most High. You remember a fellow when the flogs attacked him? You remember how Egypt was smelling? Mr. Museven, the Lord have showed you the signs in the campaign trial. You tried so very much to eliminate Robert Chagulani Sentamu, but you failed. 
And to our surprise, you failed to decrypt the signs before you. You failed to recite what happened to fellow. You failed to recite what happened to all dictators. All dictators. Hossein Mubarak was in a cage. Now these days, you walk in a coffin, a breadproof coffin, because you are not certain who is going to blow off your head. Or the wicked man, old as you are, withered as you are, look at your, co look at your skin, you are withered, old man. But you are still killing people. Do you think you are, you have a feeling that you are immortal? No, you are not. You are just being, I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Seven. To kill people for 50 years, for 60 years. You even bragged that you started killing conscious minds from the 60s up to death. You have killed them. But they are multiplying to your surprise, to your detriment, your own children, your own grandchildren within the Cabano Insidious group, a murderous group you initiated in the 60s, are the one coming out and tell their young ones that you know what? These people are indoctrinating us to be murderers as they have been. Now, it is in the broad daylight. The Kabano is known, dear brothers and sisters on the African continent. There is a group, Museveni is the leader of it. It is a murderous group, a group which is responsible for injecting substance, wrong substance in the infants of Uganda because they are afraid that they are smaller in number and Ugandans are producing. Museven is responsible. He is responsible for burning all the schools, the schools he found in Uganda, the schools which had a standard on a world scale or on a continental scale. Museven is burning all those schools. Museven, he is immunizing forcefully. Museven, he is forcefully immunized the infants of Uganda so that he can curb the population of the natives of Ugandans. And he bring his people from Rwanda to occupy the land. Museven intentionally, through the Kabano group, they initiated that each and every Ugandan should renew their citizenship. Dear brothers and sisters, remember, a man who initiated all this was a former refugee. He came in Uganda, historically, historically speaking, at the age of 12. Either in the early 40s, or in the mid 40s, or late 40s. This is Museven. The one who stripped us of our citizenship as nationals of Uganda. So this is the seven who wants us to keep quiet. This is the seven who thinks that we will be subdued by his use of the gun, which is a lie. Museven, dear brothers and sisters on the African continent, African Union, African Union, African Union, this is a clarion call. This is to inform you, Father, we are not going to be tired. African Union, we have been informing you that Museven he is killing people. Museven is kidnapping the young generation of Uganda. Museven is kidnapping vigorous young men of Uganda. Innocent people, he wants... He wants the economy to be controlled by Chinese and Indians. African Union, we are demanding the unconditional release of all political prisoners being incarcerated in any gazetted places. The dungeons created from, by Museveni solely to put fear, to torture, looking to, for the information 
which is not there. The things His Excellency Robert Chagulanyi Sentamu does, it is always in the broad daylight. The message he started with from get go, he is still the same message, unaltered, untampered with, up to date. It is the, still the same message. He is arguing Ugandanese to be inclusive. To vibrate matters of national importance. That is the message. Musafin, you are torturing boys and girls of Uganda thinking that there is a militaristic rebellion being organized against you. Musafin, you are going to die in your movie. None of us is going to blast, but we're going to expose you to the core and you'll be held accountable and you'll be aligned in the dock and you will answer each and every atrocity you have committed. Mr. Seven. that is a fact. You will kill those you will kill. Those who will go into your dragnet, they will go. It will be the grace of the Most High. You cannot kill somebody without the grace of God. Seven. Seven. you cannot inflict pain on the fleshly body without the grace of the Most High because he gave us knowledge to calculate, to observe and discern what could be the problem? But if we cannot discern that, that means the Lord have forsaken us. And his forsakenness, moreover, we appreciate. Because everything is God. Everything is God. Even Satanel, even Balsbo does not know the ministry the mystery of creation even Saturn even Belsbo none of them knows the mystery of creation God God from the formless form Mr. Seven all forms were formed formless form. All forms were formed. That means self-creation It is a prerogative to the divine alone. And God, he himself, it is the divine. He is the divine. God himself is the divine. Mr. Seven, deceive you not. Deceive ye not. You are nothing or the wicked man. For the fact that they refill you. They do you service like a car. We receive information that the disappearance of babies in the hospital, they drain blood out of them and they refill you. We receive information. Musafin, we receive information. Babies are disappearing in the hospital to keep you alive because they drain fresh blood from babies and put it into your old, wicked, rotting, evil flesh. <laughs> you are so evil. And all that comes out of your calf. You are so evil, old man and your wife. The entire family. You have tormented us. Mr. Seven. you have tormented us. And even yourself, you are wondering, why don't they start pushing, fighting me? But the God, the God whom we serve, does not allow us to, to shed blood. The moment he will allow us, ah, Seven. the things you have done to us, Museven, the things you have done to the people of Uganda. Museven, the things you have done to the people of Uganda. It is beyond our reckoning. It is known to God. And God is judging you. And God will punish you, Mr. Museven. Have no doubt about that. The punishment of the Most High goes even to the third generation from the Papa Traitor. To the third generation from that of the perpetrator. The punishment of the must die. 
Our Father embraced you. They fed you. They raised you. The past cannot be regarded without regret. I can picture Mzee Bonifance Bianyima, your foster father, who gave your mother, Esterika Kakandiko, and your father, Kareches, according to LBS Rumbuye Broadcasting Service. They tell us, old man, you have made our fathers to regret a lot. But to your surprise, you never calculated the misgivings. These are the one that makes you like you're seated on a hot seat. You are seated on a hot plate. You stole the election. You stole the leadership. You stole an election of Robert Chagulang Center Mu, but it has become a thorny seat. It has become a thorny seat. You are not seated. You are standing. You are not even standing because you cannot stand for an hour old as you are. Your sin of your fruit in your joints cannot flow anymore. Science. Nature. You walk with cannula in your thighs. They drain your blood. You continue killing the infancy. Because you feel like you haven't done what you wanted. <laughs> Can't you imagine, Seven? What you've done in darkness, it has been revealed in the broad daylight. Really? What you're planning to do, it come out straight away. Because... Those who serve you there, they know how evil you are. So they leak the information so that it can be known to all the people of Africa. Thus, we vibrate by propagating it further from Apostle ASP Asime and Rumbuye Broadcasting Service. Those are the source where we get the information that will keep on informing the people of Africa up until we wear the victor's crown. When the struggle is over, we shall wear the victor's crown. We shall wear the victor's crown. We shall wear the victor's crown. When the struggle is over, we shall wear the victor's crown in the new Uganda. We shall wear the victor's crown in the new Uganda when the struggle is over. When the struggle is over of uprooting you out of our political institutions, we shall wear the victor's crown. Blessed be to you, Heavenly Father, the creator of heaven and earth. Heavenly Father, we give thanks and praise to your holy name, having allowed us to vibrate, having allowed us the breath of life to come here and we shed a light on our plight as the people of the Republic of Uganda have been being subjugated for the past four decades, dear Lord. Dear Lord, the punishment is too severe to us. Dear Lord, we are grateful because the Holy Scripture reminds us that the Lord will never forget his people, that the Lord will always come to the rescue of those who put him first. Thus, Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the courage that you put before us so that we can speak against the injustices up until we uproot that which is freely from the righteous places. Blessed be to you, Heavenly Father. Glory be to you, Heavenly Father. Protect the human race, Heavenly Father. Protect the human race, Heavenly Father. Give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding because we believe it resides under your wings, Heavenly Father. Protect the National Unity Platform, men of goodwill, so that the accomplishment of what you started through Robert Chagulani Center can come into manifestation as we are witnessing it and we are part of it. We are sojourning. The journey is kind of tiring. But dear brothers and sisters, Ugandanese, do not give up. In his latest song, His Excellency Robert Chagulani Sentamu reminded us, I can see it in your eyes that he's trying to give up. But whenever that evil thought of giving up strikes, remember why you started in the first place. 
at the reasons that made you to enter into the struggle are being rectified? No, they are not being rectified. So, that is the threshold that we should continue speaking the truth up until we prevail. Blessed be to you, Lord, and good is always from you. Stay blessed, dear brothers and sisters on the African continent. Stay blessed, dear br brothers and sisters on the African continent. Big upon yourself, dear brothers and sisters, in the incarceration and the collection of services on the continent of Africa, especially here in South Africa. Dear brothers and sisters, you are in those places for a reason. Dear brothers and sisters, you are in collection of services for a reason. The only way you can make it a productive place, it is to put the reasons that took you there into consideration and weigh them, whether they were worthy or they were not worthy. Dear brothers and sisters, God is love. The truth will set us free. Dear brothers and sisters, in collection of services, read books, read books, read books. Embrace library more than a kitchen. Heavenly Father, protect the children of our brothers and sisters who are doing time. Dear brothers and sisters, let us pray for our brothers and sisters in prisons on the continent of Africa and in South Africa, most importantly, so that they can become members of the society productively when they get reunited into the society. Heavenly Father, protect the children who are straying in the ghetto, unsupervised, with, sharp, with sharp objects, because both parents are doing time in jail. Protect them, Heavenly Father. We believe that Africa, we believe that Africa, the scientists which are going to break the cord, the scientists which will break the cord, they can emerge from prison. So we are hopeful that a correctional service, as its word, in a definition, means that exactly. Blessed be to you, Lord. Oh, shush, shush.